This video was originally recorded at the annual Buddhism and Psychotherapy program held at Menla Retreat and Dewa Spa in Phoenicia, New York. To learn more about this annual program, please visit menla.us. No, I, I, no, seriously. It'll, it'll go in my estate when I'm here. It looks like actually the Tibetan cursive writing. It's, it's like remarkable. my little squeezed writing is what it is. Yeah. Um, then a, a few years ago, I was, I was teaching in, San, in Santiago in Chile uh, to a Spanish audience, of most therapists interested in Buddhism or Buddhists interested in therapy. In Barcelona? No, in Santiago, in, in yeah. Chile, yeah. First time I had been in South America, which was amazing. It was, the, the people were beautiful. Um, and one guy there, hearing me talk, it said, oh, there's a poem by Pablo Neruda, who's like the, you know, the hero in Santiago. Pablo yeah, no, oh, yeah. yeah uh, about poetry. And he read it in Spanish, and then he translated it for me in English. So I think it fits with everything, so I'm going to read you that. Yeah, yeah, no. I, that, that oh. This is he, a typed version. Um, <laughs> it, it's just called Poetry. And it was at that age, poetry came to get me. I'm not sure, not sure where it came from, from winter or river. Not sure how or when, no, they, they were not voices, they were not words, nor silence, but from a street it called me, from night's branches. Suddenly among the others amid violent fires or coming back alone, there it was, faceless, and it touched me. <laughs> I did not know what to say, my mouth did not know how to name, my eyes were blind, and something beat inside my soul, fever or lost wings. And I went on making my way, solving that burn, and I wrote the first vague line, vague without substance, pure nonsense, pure wisdom, of someone who knows nothing. And I suddenly saw heaven scattered and open, planets, throbbing fields, the shadow, wounded, riddled by arrows, fire and flowers, the overwhelming night, the universe. And I, minimal being, drunk from the great starry void, akin, resembling the mystery, felt a pure part of the abyss. I rolled with the stars, my heart unraveled in the wind. You have any Spanish? <laughs> uh, no, only in English. I don't speak Spanish. You don't have the Spanish? No, the Spanish must be beautiful. I'm oh, sure that, but the okay. English is beautiful. Pablo Neruda, beautiful, right? Okay. That's why when I was 17, I went to Joy Hill Touch, but I was reading. That Where did you go? Spanish poetry. Really? Yeah, it freaked me out. Right? Really? Right really? Where did you go? You went to Cuba? Huh? You went to Cuba, or no? They wouldn't accept my. Uh, they, they said I was I, I was six foot three and weighed one hundred and forty five pounds. Oh. They said, "Oh, Don Quixote is coming to save the revolution. <laughs> Thank you so much, but you'll be killed in five minutes. Uh -huh. <laughs> you won't be able to help some other way." Huh. I had a gun. Uh, you could take a gun in an airplane in those days. Really? Yeah, they didn't even look. Uh -huh. I'm sorry, I, that's intruding. No, it's fine. <laughs> that's a powerful public. Can you read Pablo Neruda one more time? I'm sorry. You want the whole thing again? It's me. Okay. Do you mind? Yeah. Una vez más. <laughs> what? Turn your mic on. Why? So oh, they can record okay. you. <laughs> <laughs> and it was at that age poetry came to get me. I'm not sure, not sure where it came from, from winter or river, not sure how or when, no, they were not voices, they were not words nor silence, but from a street it called me, from night's branches, suddenly among the others, amid violent fires or coming back alone, there it was, faceless, and it touched me. I did not know what to say. My mouth did not know how to name, my eyes were blind, and something beat inside my soul, fever or lost wings. 
And I went on making my way, solving that burn, and I wrote the first vague line, vague without substance, pure nonsense, pure wisdom of someone who knows nothing. And I suddenly saw heaven scattered and open, planets, throbbing fields, the shadow wounded, riddled by arrows, fire, and flowers, the overwhelming night, the universe. And I, minimal being, drunk from the great starry void, akin, resembling the mystery, felt a pure part of the abyss. I rolled with the stars, my heart unraveled in the wind. <laughs> It's just called poetry. And Neruda. Pablo Neruda. Pablo Neruda. Neruda. Pablo Neruda. He, he was uh, not Spanish, right? He's a uh, Latino. Uh, he's from Chile, I Venezuela. think. Chile. Yeah. 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 So isn't there, there was that Chinese, uh, what? there was that Chinese Zen, uh, uh, a gateless gate thing of, of the golden wind? Remember you told yeah, me yeah. about this? That, that, that's what yes, this reminds me. Yeah. yeah. What, 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 how does that go? I don't remember. Okay. I wrote about it because we, we, we... Really? Yeah, I wrote about it in the trauma book. Anyway. Okay, I have one more big thing to lay on you. So, this is from a book by Adam Phillips. Do you, any of you know who Adam Phillips is? Uh, Adam Phillips is a British child psychoanalyst and writer. He wrote the first, uh, the first book he ever wrote was a little biography of Winnicott. So he's a, 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 a um, Winnicott whose famous book is Playing in Reality and um, who's been a huge inspiration for me. He's the one I was talking about yesterday who talks about the good enough mother who doesn't retaliate and doesn't abandon in the face of her child's ruthless attacks. And I, I see Winnicott's take on the mother as like an analogy for what we're doing in meditation, um, creating that same state of mind. So Adam Phillips, next generation down, wrote a biography of Winnicott that kind of brought him to everybody's attention. And then he went on, he's written you know, probably 15 books, uh, very good writer. His most famous book is called On Kissing, Tickling, and Being Bored. Mm -hmm. On Kissing, Tickling, and Being Bored. Uh, but he has a book called Missing Out that came out a couple of years ago where uh, he's writing as a psychotherapist, talking, I think he's talking about um, what, what, where we were going yesterday about the, the um, ego's need for uh, satisfaction, the, the endless need for satisfaction when you're operating from a self-centered place, mm -hmm. and how uh, psychotherapy in, in Adam Phillips's view and his take on Freud and Winnicott is actually trying to turn that orientation a away from uh, a, a kind of hungry ghost-like need for endless uh, um, uh, rapport, actually, uh, or uh, acknowledgement or attention or affection, whatever it might be, towards a concern for others. So um, I've copied out a lot of stuff from him with, that I want to read, because it makes sense to me when I read it. Um, and he actually, it's interesting, he actually starts out uh, uh, quoting Neruda. I didn't notice that before, but I wrote it down here. Someone who knows nothing. Uh, he was in, he's inspiring him uh, in, in his writing. So this chapter is called On Not Getting It. So, what? Uh, on Not Getting It. On Not, like not, on not Getting it. it. Yeah, like mm -hmm. the great doubt, as we say in Zen. Not Getting It might be described here as a determined, tenacious ignorance that is in the service of something better, something better than complicity, not an innocence or a faux naivete, but a belief, for example, that in some situations, not getting it is more revealing and getting it is more obscuring. That we can be fobbed off by satisfactions of getting it and oddly enlivened by the perplexity of not getting it. Mm -hmm. So I see this relevant to meditation where we're like, why are we doing this? You know, and what are we doing? And what are we trying to, you know? 
So the idea of opening it up, like you don't know. There was well, a... The, well, well, not getting it means not, not fitting it in with a preconceived Not fitting it, concept, exactly. So that you have a dualistic knowledge exactly. and then you turn away from it. Exactly. And then not getting it more revealing because it makes you merge with the thing more. Exactly. And give yourself over to it. Exactly. So when you don't get it, it gets you. Exactly. <laughs> no, exactly That's right. really good. From this perspective, you could say, for example, if you understand why you are with the person you are with, then you are not really with them. You could say that the belief that there are consensual objects of desire is an anxiety about objects of desire, about the unfathomable idiosyncrasy of desiring, or an anxiety about there not being any objects of desire. And you could also say, perhaps less obviously, he, he, he likes to write like this, so you have to sort of get into it. And you could also say, perhaps less obviously, that if you want to be with someone who gets you, you prefer collusion to desire, safety to excitement, sometimes good things to prefer, but not always the things most wanted. We have been taught to wish for it, but the wish to be understood may be our most vengeful demand, may be the way we hang on as adults to our grudge against our mothers, the way we never let our mothers off the hook for their not meeting our every need. Wanting to be understood as adults can be, among many other things, our most violent form of nostalgia. Most violent form of what? Of nostalgia. Huh? The artist, in this view, is someone who can tolerate not only not understanding, but also not being understood. In meditation, oh, this is me, huh. this, is, this is my writing. In meditation, we face something similar, the perplexity of the self about itself. That violent form of, no of nostalgia, the grudge, is one of the roots of the self-concept, unloved, unworthy, insecure, the clinging, craving, grasping that perpetuates the dualism of self and other. That's me. I didn't really mean to read that. I just want to read you Adam Phillips. But. So Adam goes on. This essential perplexity is highlighted in the contrasting aims of psychoanalytic treatment. In the question of cure, is the aim of psychoanalytic treatment to increase the person's understanding of herself or to free her to desire? And are these aims complementary, inextricable from each other, or mutually exclusive? Does my understanding of my so-called self free my desire or inhibit it? Does it, in William James's words, allow for novelty and possibility forever leaking in? Is the good life one in which I get it, get to some extent what's going on inside me and in others, get who I am, or one in which I don't need to, one in which the examined life is unlivable? One definition of a psychoanalytic cure, for example, might be a newfound freedom to ironize, to give irony to, any description of oneself. So have we constructed a picture of the self made for understanding, just as one might write a poem, be taught to write a poem, made for literary criticism? What would it be to be a person who no one could easily describe, or that no one could come up with a description of that seemed pertinent or useful or illuminating? We have psychiatric diagnoses to ensure that there are no people we don't get. <laughs> In the smaller world of literary criticism and the larger world of so-called popular culture, this is known as the difficulty of modern poetry. If, at least as a reader of poetry, your project is not to get it, you are better off reading John Ashbery than Philip Larkin. When Ashbery was asked in an interview why his poetry was so difficult, he replied that when you talk to other people, they eventually lose interest, but that when you talk to yourself, people want to listen in. <laughs> no one, other perhaps than Ashbery, talks to themselves in the way he writes poetry. But what Ashbery is suggesting in his whimsically shrewd way is that the wish to communicate estranges people from each other. If you talk to people, he suggests, they lose interest. If you ignore them, or rather if you ignore them by talking to yourself, they are engaged. 
as though curiosity might sometimes be preferred to consolation, listening in or overhearing preferred to communication or comprehension. The wish to understand or be understood, to, as we say, communicate or be accessible, might give a false picture, might be a hiding place, might be a retreat or a refuge. And then just one more piece. It is not an increase in self-knowledge that Freud describes, but its limits. He tells us a story about the need to grow out of a need for understanding and being understood. The child needs his parents to get him, to be sufficiently attentive to his needs and fears, and then he needs to be weaned of this. Understanding first, by definition, within reason, then the freedom to also not understand or need to. Psychoanalysis is, in fact, the treatment that weans people from their compulsion to understand and be understood. It is an after education <laughs> in not getting it. Through understanding to the limits of understanding, this is Freud's new version of an old project. Freud's work is best read as a long elegy for the intelligibility of our lives. We make sense of our lives in order to be free, not to have to make sense. <laughs> Adam Phillips. Adam Phillips. About we, Asbury. We make sense of our lives in order to be free, not to have to make sense. So, you know, he sort of enjoys the playing with the, his own logic to try to, but, but I think he's very good at using words to you, 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 you know, make you, make you think in a way you don't ordinarily think. Um, That's a new thing. You like? It's like the <clears throat> Buddhist scientific slash philosophical thing that the only definitive meaning teaching is a pure negation. Mm -hmm. Explain what that because, what do you uh, mean? Because negative cognition is always open-ended. When you know there's no elephant, it's like you never really come, you don't find the non-elephant. You never do. You just don't find the elephant. And you develop a tolerance for that not inability to find it. Mm -hmm. And that's the only definitive mm -hmm. uh, theory or whatever it is, is this kind of pure negation. Mm -hmm. That um, all seemingly getting or capturing or fitting in or making sense type of explanations mm -hmm. are only relative, mm -hmm. which doesn't mean they're utterly invalid within their context, mm -hmm. but it means they can't be attributed like some sort of absolute absolute power. And, uh, and one is always open to further experience to revise, you know, something like that. But within the, the convent, relative descriptions of processes and things, mm -hmm. there are better and worse for right, sure. Right, of course. So that doesn't crush. People are so used in the West to absolutist type of theories that they feel that relativist theory will be nihilistic and will be crazy and will provide no control you know, because they're so insecure. And they want to have daddy controlling everything 100%. But, uh, and then you get dogmas and extremism and fanaticism and things like that. So what these, these, these brilliant people are saying is just completely like that. It's amazing. I think for the, for the issue, you know, the addiction, anxiety, depression, like that, what, what, uh, what Adam Phillips is getting at is that the thing that's driving a lot of that is that, that incomplete feeling, that sort of vengefulness of, you know, like, I never got enough kind of thing. And so there's this reaching for something that will uh, complete the picture. And, uh, uh, and then in the Buddhist, uh, emphasis on self, exploration of the self and understanding selflessness, this, uh, this ability to keep it open, what Bob was just talking about, the, the pure negation as the, you, you know, like not getting it, you, you know, but keeping the field open so that we're, we're, we're looking all the time and curious all the time, but not fixating on any one aspect of who we think we are, who we have to be. But, but, yeah, but, 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 but on, on the other hand, there's a kind of razor's edge yep. where there's a kind of resignation that can set in that itself is a kind of getting it. 
Mm -hmm. And then there's an attachment to, okay, I don't know anything. And, uh, yes. And then, it, 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 so there, the thing about the negation of emptiness or selflessness, a type of thing, is that that is the result of having totally, absolutely put yeah. the absolute desire to get and to know and then have it sort of expand into the openness rather than pull back. For example, yes. Descartes, mm -hmm. when he was seeking his self, he admitted defeat that he couldn't find it. And so he, he, but, but he didn't push ahead into that or he didn't, he didn't not find the not finding or something, if you want to put it, something like that. So what he did was he said, oh, well, I didn't find it because I was looking for it as an object, but actually it's my subjectivity. So therefore, I'm absolutely certain about my subjectivity. So then cogito, ergo sum, was an absolute point of certainty for him. In other words, he didn't push further mm -hmm. where even the certainty of uncertainty was not clear or mm -hmm. something like that. I can't explain it. And he did it because he didn't have an analyst. Or he, I usually say, actually, except for today, he didn't have a, a like a lama or a roshi or a, a good one, not mm. like some idiot, but a good one, who, who would, who, to whom would give a kind of feedback like, oh, so now, oh, now you're all back and happy about how absolute you are, because you've defined yourself out of having to be found, but actually you, without realizing, are considering yourself still a real object that you possess. So he, no, someone else couldn't kind of give him that mm -hmm. reflection back. Mm -hmm. So then he set up. He set us off for three centuries of nonsense mm -hmm. <laughs> because he didn't have the analyst. Mm. So the you know vipassana is analysis. That's yeah. what it is. Yeah, that's the supreme meditation too. Not shamatha. Mm -hmm. Anybody can be. The Nazis are one pointed about their stupid swastika or yeah. their like ridiculous hat with the weird thing or their dumb gun. Right. You know they are absolute about it. So that openness is something different, right? Mm. I think. What do you think? I think, yes. What's <laughs> <laughs> mm. it? Somebody oh. had something. Yeah, let's wait for microphones microphone. for questions. Microphone. Could you That's please okay. read that paragraph? Oh, how encouraged are you this morning? <laughs> I'm good. Yeah. Look at that smile. That's great. That's a good sleep. You know, that's the thing. Sleep. You were right. Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Excuse that's me. Right. That paragraph you said you wrote, yeah, you yeah. didn't mean to read. Yeah, yeah. Could you read that for me? Yeah, they're just notes, really, but because I was, I, I think I was going to use the, uh, the Adam Phillips thing and something I was writing. But um, uh, I'm saying that the, that the artist. The artist in this view is someone who can tolerate not only not understanding, but also not being understood. In meditation we face something similar, the perplexity of the self about itself. That violent form of nostalgia, the grudge, is one of the roots of the self-concept. The, the feeling of being unloved, unworthy, insecure, the clinging, craving, or grasping that perpetuates the dualism of self and other. Well, I, I'm sure, I, I think it's in every book. <laughs> oh, good. Good, I'm glad. Good. Okay, I'll put it in the next book. <laughs> I'll just lead with that. Beautiful. Yeah. So, uh, it's a great topic, this uh, the curiosity. <laughs> So it's a great topic, this, the value of curiosity around this experience that we have of craving, yearning, uh, obsessing, feeling depressed, yeah. feeling anxious, um, wanting the addictive experience. Yeah. So I, I find this helpful we're emphasizing the value of being curious about it. Yes. Can you, uh, Mark, make any comments on in the moment, 
the feeling of being unable to uh, separate from it. So in other words, uh, I feel this depression, I'm in a cloud. I should be curious about this, but I can't. I, I can't quite do it. I'm feeling an urge for this experience. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I really, this is part of the, uh, the misidentified self that is craving, I should be curious about it. Yeah. Uh, shit, I just want to drink. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I just, yeah. that right no, in that moment, a, a can powerful. you make any comments? Well, I mean, that's the hardest thing because we're, we're um, uh, conditioned in such a way that we don't actually stay with the feelings, that the, the feelings propel the actions. You, you know, and that all happens subconsciously, not really unconsciously, but we'll have that, you know, that little itch for the, for the thing, for the drink or, for, or whatever, and we know we're going to go for it, you, you, you know. Uh, like, we've already made the decision to go for it. So to be able to, I think the reason meditation in particular is, can be helpful, though it's, it's a lifetime's worth of work to get there, is that it, it actually is possible to train yourself to stay longer with the disturbing feeling rather than jumping into action. The same thing is, is true with anger or with uh, you, you know, any kind of uh, in, intense uh, uh, desire that we don't actually stay with the feeling to explore it. We're, we've already decided, you know, we've, our, our minds, have, we've already uh, uh, taken the next step even before we take the next step uh, and that and that's all and that's happening basically outside of awareness so the curiosity is oh let's stay with it a little longer and you can see your mind deciding over and over again oh I'm gonna say this I'm gonna do this I'm gonna get that I'm gonna drink this you know but because you've taken a vow to like not move you, you know then the repetitive urgency of it, you know, just start, it starts to become more like a, um, a, a musical refrain or something, you know, that the, the, charge, the charge diminishes. And I, and I think that's like the growth of equanimity and the decrease of what we would call the, the libidinal charge, you know, the sort of erotically tinged charge to all these, even to aggression. Um, starts to lose its hold over you. So they, they talk about the, the stickiness of those urges. But uh, it, it's actually learning to stay with it longer. It's just like that becomes a challenge. Um, and, it, and sometimes it becomes more interesting than uh, 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 you already know sort of the disappointment that lies on the other side of getting the thing that you've decided you're going to get or saying the nasty thing that you really want to say. So the, the challenge of being able to stay with the impulse uh, becomes more interesting, potentially more satisfying than the release that, that you are imagining. Hello again. Good morning. I have a little bit of a voice back today. Um, what you had just talked about, it made me think of, and I'm not sure if anyone else made this connection, um, but the whole idea with like a flow state, um, and I forgot there's a book called Flow, and I forgot the author's name, um, but some, this, you know, the whole idea long, of... Long, unpronounceable name. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. I can never remember it. Um, and uh, it's... It made me think of like curiosity and play, um, and how you know as children we we have this whole like you know we're literally driven by our curiosity and you know play without um, an actual destination in mind like we're just doing play for the sake of it. Um, and there's also a book I just started reading called Play, um, and and I was just thinking about like what you think about being in this flow state and it. Um, because I've been very guilty of being in that flow state and it almost feels like a meditation almost where you get lost in the moment. And I just wonder if you had any comments about, about that um, and maybe the benefits of anxiety, depression, and addiction 
bring them up together. Did, did you say you have been guilty of being in a flow state? <laughs> She yeah, did say I mean, it's, I didn't mean to say guilty as in a bad thing, but like I get in that state a lot, and I like I notice myself getting out of like whatever like low energy, low vibrational feeling I may be feeling, if I'm just like in in the flow, so to speak. Right. So, but the being guilty about being in the flow <laughs> is a post-flow state interpretation of, of where <laughs> actually where you were, where you are. And uh, so that's like um, that's like the what we were looking at when we a little bit discussed about the seeking of the self, with the meditation on selfless as being a seeking of the self, and then uh, then when one seeks it with full determination and total curiosity and doesn't withdraw on some rationalization of like well that's impossible to find and like you know it's a subject and an object like all these kind of like dodges. Uh, then there, then things do disappear, and then one disappears, and that's a kind of flow. That's a release, a feeling of release of disappearing. Mm -hmm. And then there's a return, and then the, the key, then the interpretation of what the disappearance was, <laughs> becomes a very, very key thing. And then the, in the in that context, in that tradition, the ideal is where the two there's like an oscillation back and forth for some period of time. And then there is the goal state, the goal, so to speak, is to be in the flow in such a way that one can also be functioning within a non-flow or a non-disappeared way. So it appeared and disappeared at the same time, in other words, something like that, which then sounds inconceivable. And, uh, but that, that would seem to be the goal. And, then, and, and yet, like by the analogy of the mirror, there seems to be a path for exceptional persons, actually, in that tradition, who can come somehow encompass that cognitive dissonance sort of through inference, actually, through kind of um, openness and through encompassing the, seeing the nature of the paradox and not collapsing it in either way and upholding being on that razor's edge. And that, that kind of person can proceed more quickly, they say. So that seems to be the challenge. That's what it reminds me. So, so that's good. Being guilty of having been in the flow state is really being guilty of not still being in it, <laughs> in a way. And so then there is the thing of, well, not to say, well, the flow was a delusion, and this is a delusion, and somehow this picking and choosing on either of the two sides is the delusion, something like that. Then, then, then there is a kind of hope of unifying it. And, and then that sounds impossible, but we totally do it. When you get up in the morning and look at your face in the mirror for whatever, you know, an eyebrow or whatever it is for a male, it's like scratching away or whatever we do. <laughs> and, and it's like you see left as right and right as left, but you don't think twice. You don't have, in a way, you could say it's unconscious that you're corrected completely. Mm. And then they have that psychological experiment. I never did it. I've always wanted to do it. Where you put on a certain glass, a certain kind of lens, and then if you first, at for a short time, you see everything upside down, mm. but then, then your brain corrects. flips it over within yeah. a short period of time. Yeah. I, I would love to do that. I never mm. had that flip feeling. Mm. <laughs> I never had that lens. I should go to some lab somewhere and have some guy do it. But, so it's unconscious, but in a way, it's also, it's a level of, you could say, corrected intuition mm. that you don't have to think, oh, this is a mirror, it's a, it's a delusion, it looks like a three-dimensional space over there through a window, but it isn't. And then somehow left and right gets reversed, and I'll correct that. And so when I want to put the correct the eyeliner on my eyebrow on my right side, I will put it on the left side. So you don't have to go through that whole thing, because it's a level of knowing that is not knowing. It, it, it's a knowing that's already, you know, fitted together, something like that. Yeah. So that's that's obviously your your task. <laughs> the, the, the Meanwhile, thing, the guilt is good. It, pro it prods you to work on it. The thing you're saying about play, yeah. I, I think, is interesting in relationship to, to um, what we're talking about, about meditation. Uh, because I always think of, of meditation as a kind of transitional uh, experience in the way that, that Winnicott talks about uh, as, the, as the infant, you know, uh, 
grows away from the mother, uh, he or she usually attaches to some kind of precious blanket or wiggle worm uh, or teddy bear or, uh, you, you know, or the mother's t-shirt or you know, something uh, that, that Winnicott called a transitional object. And one of the characteristics of the transitional object is that it's, it has a special status. It's not the child, it's not the mother. Uh, you, you know, uh, it's not me, but it's not not me. It's, it's holding the, this space. And uh, uh, Winnicott makes a lot of, uh, of that and, and talks about how that, that experience of the transitional object grows into what he calls transitional experiencing of all kinds, with, uh, with play being the first, uh, because the, his, his ideal of a child playing is that uh, he or she knows that the mother is, you know, in the next room, that, that her, the umbrella of her attention is uh, still with the child, but she's not interfering. So there's, an, there's enough space for the child to begin to have a sense of his her, or her own continuation of being, you, you know, a sort of ongoing flow, like you're talking about, that where the child's lost in play, but also very present in play. So the book I wrote called Going on Being, that's, a, that's taken from Winnicott from his description of that. Um, and and I, I, I always think of uh, the breath or, or mindfulness or bare attention in some way as being like a transitional object in that we're moving from the, you know, a fixed relationship of ourselves to ourselves to uh, a separation from that, uh, uh, you, you know, into a, a mysterious area that we don't really know. But the, that field that we're setting up is sort of like the holding environment that the, that the mother sets up for the infant and then gradually releases her into. Um, so You know, what I'm thinking is that, from what you said, it, it could well be that um, the flow state is the human nature that all humans are mm -hmm. supposed to be in a flow state all the time. And that all of the, and, and mm -hmm. if, if their interactions and actions were in a sense, as you know, part of a flow state, then that's a flow state is like a love state, and then that then the the feeling of freedom and blissfulness of being in a flow state would be automatically the sort of the woof or the I can never remember which is a woof and which is a warp a warp and a mm -hmm. woof. Who knows? But it would be like the the the, the texture of the fabric of interaction between mm -hmm. beings. And Wilhelm Reich's thing of orgon energy is like connected to that and his concept of the emotional plague. Because the, the emotional plague is then a person is conditioned because of violence and militarism actually, which expands into militarism and violence in the family, is conditioned to shut off their inner sensitivity and their, what he called I think, inner sense of streaming, where the orgon energy is, in a, is a flow of state. And then, uh, and only contacting the, the brief section, the brief, brief segment of like approved sensuality, you know, like the mini orgasm of the procreative orgasm that is only one is allowed to have, type of thing. And then that person who's in that emotional plague state, it feels very left out, very much wants to get it, wants to get out of there, but they're, they can't feel it internally. So then they become sadistic, they become more violent, they spread, they end. And then he has this brilliant thing where they feel threatened that they're going to be dissolved or their sense of control and, separate, and, and safe separation is going to be dissolved by when they encounter someone who is in a flow state. And therefore, what they're really afraid of is themselves feeling a streaming that would feel that would threaten their sense of fixed structure with which they're shooting the world and defending themselves with their armor and their whole thing. And so they go to strangle and to destroy that, that representative or node of the flow state. In his case, he called it the murder of Christ. You know, the murder of a being that is a channel of, of the natural energy of life. So. So instead of being guilty about being in a flow state, you should be guilty for not being in a flow state, <laughs> obviously. <laughs>
<laughs> is that so? And and the other thing is that Menla, what we, what our, you know, my wife, when we were given Menla to make a, a medicine Buddha healing place for people in this emotionally plagued nation and planet, at the moment, on some level, uh, she she had the idea that uh, that people, when the minute they entered the, the gate, they should feel relieved, relieved to whatever degree they're capable of. So that's like our motive, you know, is that men law should be, that's what men law's motive is, mm -hmm. that's what the Buddha's motive is. And um, the problem being, you see, that if you go up to the emotional plague person, and this comes back to the thing about, we had this conversation yesterday, if you go up to the emotional plague person, you in the flow state, and them desperately wanting to be, but afraid when they feel anything like that, and then immediately wanting to be violent, to shut it down, subliminally knowing that it's, they're getting the vibe of it, you know, then um, you can expect that it, it won't work. It's like you go up to give a paranoiac a huge hug, and they perceive a being that's coming to consume them or destroy them or something, and so they'll just fight it all. And that's Buddha's problem. When the Buddha attained Buddhahood, or any of the people, millions of people since, they see other beings as potentially flowing and fine. And uh, they frustrated that their, their frustration from which compassion comes is they, they know they can't just somehow blast them into being cooled out. You know, mm. They can't. And so those, those people themselves have to try to mobilize curiosity to get out of their prison. They have to mobilize, they want to get something better than where they are, and they have to have that motivation. And so that's why they say the greatest gift there is, is teaching. You giving of material things, giving of security, are two, the two other kinds of main types of giving. But the greatest kind of giving is the giving of teaching. Because the giving of true teaching, you know, teaching that leads to that. Because teaching enables the person themselves to, to find their own nature type of thing. And that's why I'm saying, inspired by Dr. Mark, that, uh, that uh, it is psychoanalysis from thousands of years ago. It is the beginning of psychoanalysis, yeah. actually. Totally. And every Dharma student should be a psychoanalyst, should train to be a psychoanalyst that's, uh, in this country. That's the only thing to do, I think. Don't you think? I do think. What? You agree? I agree. You ready to train them? Yeah. Educate them? Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's a great question. That's a great question. Much nicer than what I've been thinking about this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell us. What? Don't tell us. <laughs> well, I've been thinking about a, a, a nuclear detonation. Mm. You know, uh, the, the, the nuclear cloud, you know, yeah. mushroom cloud. Yeah. And the whole planet has, is, anyone even who saw the picture, it was a major lesson in impermanence. Yeah. Although Truman should not be forgiven that he didn't drop it in the bay in front of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Why he dropped it on the people is beyond. But you know, you can show it by like, then there's some fish, it's sad for the fish, but, but it's not that some poor people scrabbling around in the kimono trying to have some, like, have some sushi. <laughs> and, uh, but, but that is the teaching that there is, in, you know, there is infinite energy in the very atoms of our body. Mm. Chain reaction means if they drop, if, if, uh, if uh, Kim Jong-un or his pal Trump with the, the two competing hairdos, <laughs> if they were to drop a bomb near here, what would vaporize us is the chain reaction of our own molecules, cells, and atoms and subatomic particles would release this infinite energy in a way that the, our tissues and things could not withstand. And we would be vaporized, right? If we were lucky enough to be within the blast horizon or whatever it's called. And so everybody realized impermanence, what's called subtle impermanence, uh, subliminally, everyone did when those things went off, you know? And when, when you see them and when you sort of vaguely hear about the theory, you know, E equals MC squared, you know? You know, M is mass. C squared is the square root the square of 186,000. That's a big amount of numbers. So, you know, that 
we all know that. Everyone knows that we are massively impermanent, and we're frightened about it, of course, completely. And then the people with them who can't bear the flow state because they're afraid of their own streaming, they they're like desperately flailing around, you know. And they really they are the objects of our compassion, 100 percent. But compassion is upaya has to be manifest as something called upaya, and I don't mean the Zen Center in Santa Fe although hopefully it's working on that. But upaya means something like a strategy, or even a trick. It can mean a trick, it can mean a strategy. I, call, I, th I say what it really means is art. You know, art, you know, you have arts and sciences. Arts and sciences doesn't just mean the arts part is not just somebody doing a painting or making a sculpture. Uh, it means also engineers, it, you know, doctors, you know, anything that you do skillfully to try to help beings. So compassion has to be artful. And it is not artful to flow state your way up to some guy with like an AK-47 and like a weird helmet and a Nazi flag and a goofy look on his face, and usually his. I think there were no females in that mob, I think, right? They, I don't think so. Maybe there were some were rooting them on who were like confused, but I don't think there were any out there, actually. They wouldn't have allowed that. That would have freaked them out. Mm. Would have been distracted them from their fear. Um, this thought. question. So, oh, what? Oh, well, I didn't quite finish. <laughs> but whatever. Interruptibility is good. Yeah, please go ahead. What's the question? What's the question? Um, on a practical level, uh, I want to ask. I have. I see a therapist, and um, I believe that he's underestimating the amount of anxiety that I feel um, throughout the day, not when I'm in his office, and. He like wants me to, okay. well, he's suggesting or he's suggesting that I stay in a, in a relationship that's causing a lot of anxiety so that I can work through it. Or, and he suggests that I do relaxation exercises to overcome the anxiety. But again, I keep thinking he's underestimating the amount of anxiety that I feel. And uh, so I, I'm, I feel like I either just stop seeing him and do what I feel I need to do because my anxiety is asking me to stop. Or I talk it through with him and express that I think he's underestimating this. And, uh, and then, but the. the, the Here, hold, on, hold on one second. Yeah. Let me just tell Bob. What's that? Um, he's seeing a therapist. Ah, oh, yeah. But he feels that the therapist is underestimating the amount of anxiety that he's experiencing. I see. Um, therapist doesn't get it. Therapist is not getting it, right. <laughs> uh, okay. The, the therapist is encouraging him to stay in a relationship that he's not sure he wants to stay in. Oh, I see. That's causing him more anxiety. And uh, teaching him, uh, encouraging him to do some relaxation exercises to help with the anxiety. Um, and he's at, a, he's, he's at a decision point, should he, uh, should he leave the therapist, um, or should he uh, um, get, have faith in what the therapist is uh, is suggesting for him? That's I think as far that's as a question for you. <laughs> well, I'd be interested in your <laughs> answer. You know, uh, but th there might be more. Let me see. Let, let's hear. Um, well, just the connection that I want to make with with that, and I I do want to hear your response. Yeah, on that. of course. Um, Generally speaking, I know that in some popular media, uh, or in a simple way, if, if, if a decision feels right, or if I'm happy with a decision, then it probably means it was the right decision. Um, May I ask a question? Has that therapist ever given you a piece of advice that you didn't like when you got it, but later turned out to be helpful? Ever? Well, I've seen him for about eight weeks. Oh, it's pretty new. And I, um, so this is how it relates also to addiction, anxiety, and depression. Um, I had a, oh, I, I still do. I have a sponsor in a twelve-step program who, who at first didn't have an opinion whether I I should or should not see a therapist because it was outside of his. Um, Influence, or it's just not really what he can do. Um, but then he he did suggest that I stay very close to the program, 
the 12 step program and in fact to make the program more important because he had never seen someone go from uh, the program, the 12 step program into therapy and, and have it turn out well. Um, so, but what I did was, this is my part in it, I, I, I did want to go out and start dating, um, even though my sponsor said, you're probably not ready. So uh, I wanted to use the therapist as a way for me to understand enough of what's going on with me to make a relationship um, workable. And, uh, and, and I'm facing the anxiety of it, so I, I want to conclude my sponsor was right. I need to stay closer to the program on my sponsor and not the therapist. And um, so, Again, to, for, I, I would feel the anxiety dissipate. I can see it if I just take myself away from the situation. But the question is, and, and that would be in, in alignment with the idea that the point of living is to be happy mm -hmm. uh, or to do things that make me happy. Not, not I don't mean addictively, like you know, doing things that are pleasurable, but doing things that make me feel like I'm happy and alive. So that's the conflict. Is okay. my that's a conflict. Okay, I can tell you exactly. I think it's safe for me to answer since I'm totally ignorant and I'm not. You a, answer first. Know. Go ahead. And that is, I think it's very clear. You answered your own question that you you should stick with doing something that you don't want to do. In this case, and that therefore you should stick with it. That's my opinion. My gut feel. Hang in there, and like, be annoyed about it, and be anxious and irritated, and hang in there with it, and, and observe that. That's my gut feeling, you know? Dr. Bob. And if the guy's a jerk ass, <laughs> if the guy happens to turn out to be a total jerk ass, then later you can thrill, be thrilled that you were able to withstand that for longer than you think you could have. Yeah. That's my view. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I think both <laughs> the 12-step um, the person, the sponsor, is that Does that cheer you up? <laughs> He hey. smiled. He smiled. I saw him smile. He's smiling. That's, what, He's smiling. that's because I'm ignorant. I can get away with that. Okay. <laughs> okay. The sponsor is right. You, you should absolutely stay with the 12-step ah, program. Good. The therapist well, is you. also right. You should absolutely stay with the therapy. A absolutely. And listen to him. Just, uh, just the... Um, the, maybe this is the anxiety speaking, but when I get back to work as a school teacher in September, the anxiety is going to, from past experience, it's going to affect my job. It's too strong. So I almost feel as if I'm uh, doing a disservice to myself and to my students if I don't overcome this quickly. And I, that could be a part of just my anxious thinking. But Yeah, it's not your anxiety speaking. But yeah, that, but, that but was you, know, you. you said you were in a 12-step thing, is that what you said? Yeah, so you had another way of dealing with your anxiety before, which was harmful to your health, right? And th that's really quick, too. Get blasted in one way or another. And so maybe the quick thing is not the best thing, and maybe you have to let, soldier on. And you can help your students anyway. You know, you, okay. can, you, can, you can worry creatively. Thank you. <laughs> Is that, is that okay? That's good. Oh, good. Yeah. That's nice. <laughs> so anyway, I'm still having the bomb is still going off. You know. Go That's ahead. Very important. Yeah. That means you have infinite energy in all of your cells. That's why you had a good sleep last night. So you feel better. We all have this infinite energy. It can be destructive if it's released unskillfully. And uh, but imagine what we can tap into gently. You know. We, nobody, nobody is short of energy. Every subatomic particle in there is like ready to like create a mushroom cloud over the town. It's part of a chain reaction. And we're all interconnected. I read something on Quora. I like Quora. And I know I'm coming to the question, but I'm sorry, I'm just let me share this. And in Quora, they said that speed of light in the Einstein thing is only the speed of light in a vacuum. It's exactly 186,000 miles per second in a vacuum. But uh, that means that it's always a little slower, luckily, in ourselves, where we resist, we're not quite a vacuum, supposedly. But uh, on the other hand, 
you know, yeah. speed of light as an absolute. You know, it is the non-relative thing in Einstein's thing. You know, speed of light that nothing can go faster. Because why? Because something that moves faster than that, their mass becomes infinite. In other words, if they go faster, they're everywhere. But that's like the clear light. Mm. So that means that at a sort of essential level, we are all everywhere, mm. too. And what I want, and what this connects to, I'm sorry, please hold the question, but I'll come back to it. What this comes into is the Heart Sutra that we chanted. And everything we've touched on this morning, I think, is this. And it has to do with where we are located, ultimately. What is our ultimate reality? And in a way, we're all ultimately located in a vacuum, in the void. You know? But the void, since the since speed of light goes through the void at the speed where mass becomes infinite, that place, rather than a place of demolition or destruction, is a place of omnipresence. So time also, beginningless and endless. Space, infinite. There's some nonsense they think, oh, Big Bang came out of nowhere, and then it's just running away from us. All those planets, they're red-shifting their way. They must be communists. They're red-shifting away, <laughs> away from us, and they're running away. And then, of course, beyond that, there's nothing. So we counted, there's a total number, and therefore, thank goodness, we're not in infinity. But of course, we are in infinity, and because we can't exclude infinity, because infinity wouldn't be infinite if it was not us. So we all are infinite, actually. And, and therefore, everything we do is play. We make a mistake taking it too seriously. In some way, we haven't gotten over the world or ourselves. And therefore, in an infinite past, infinite numbers of beings, just like us, have become perfect Buddhas. And infinite numbers of them can go into samadhis and they can go into the profound illumination, and then Avalokiteshvara among us will feel like Heart Sutra, they'll think everything is empty, and of, uh, you know, matter is voidness, voidness is matter, and then some Shariputras will be consternated, but they'll want to know what's going on. And so there is a field. We're all a vast field. And what is that field? And that's why Buddha was happy, and that's why we can doubt and be curious and we can play and we can be in flow and not in flow because we're held, we are ourselves holding this field. And this is the Nirvana field. And it's already, we're holding it already. And we just have these veils and these obscurations that block us from enjoying it fully. And, and we feel nervous to be there and therefore but yet we know that that's more realistic to be in that state. And therefore we feel guilty when we're not. But on the other hand, we feel safer when we're not, on the other hand. Because nobody, it seems like nobody else is, this kind of thing. But the key thing is, we are what I felt. And that this thing comes back to your faith thing. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not faith in some omnipotent thing that's going to take care of it for us. Because actually we are it. And that's a heresy. That's the pantheistic heresy in theism. They burn you at the stake for that one. That's a dangerous one in a bunch of uptight, like, you know, uh, Republicans, racists, or whatever they're lay, or could be religious fanatics, you know. It doesn't matter. It's somebody, somebody who's got something they hide behind that makes them exclude other beings, right? So this is the thing. This field is this great field. It's a good field. It's perfect. There's nothing wrong with it. And this, in other words, the heart sutra we chant, there's in countless numbers of enlightened beings who have, and they didn't leave us behind. They're not in some other world. They are not dead. They're here. They're, we're held in their mind, and their mind is one with our mind. So we are also holding it together, holding ourselves together. And when, that means that we are holding ourselves together when there's a, there's a centra petal or fugal, which is the one that flings out. Fugal. Fugal. There's this, every subatomic particle of our thing has an infinite centrifugal energy, which is released in the chain reaction released by the theory of hate, a nuclear explosion, chain reaction of hatred. So w love is more powerful, that means. So relax. Please, what's your question?
Hello. Um, I oh, guess. I thought you had a question. Oh no, it's me. Oh, you did. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I guess my question kind of has to do with blockages. Uh, about a year and a half ago, um, like I'm usually a, a beat, fairly happy, open person, um, and I was, you know, like feeling, you know, good about myself, really getting into my flow and appreciating and grateful and just, you know, feeling quite good and, and settled. Um, and then about a year and a half ago, I lost three friends within like two months. Uh, they passed away. And then that winter, my dad died. Ooh. And it kind of just- plus your dad. Yeah. He actually used to come to class with me sometimes when I took her class in school. Her dad used to come to class with her when she took your class in school. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, he enjoyed it a lot. Oh, um, I'm glad. Yeah, in his later years, he and was opening up to... How old was he? He was in his 80s. In his 80s? Yep. He had me an, uh, still older. too young. Yeah. <laughs> he was 87, but he had a good 87 years. That's good. And I was able to keep him home and be with him when he passed. That's um, wonderful. Which I was happy about, but it, it afterwards, I guess... You know, it's, it's frustrating in some ways how long it takes to get over things like this. And I also just really felt like the world just kind of got pulled out from under me and I really had like lost my sense of self. Um, you know, I just wasn't really enjoying anything more. It, like, it just felt everything was just bleh, you know, like the stuff I used to love to do, I just didn't really care about anymore. It was just, you know, and I'm doing better now. I'm seeing a therapist and she's wonderful but I'm still having trouble just motivating, just you know, getting out of bed in the morning and trying to, you know, I recently quit my job, I was bartending, so I'm looking to do something different and I'm kind of in that space in between mm -hmm. um, where I'm trying to heal um, and get better so I can figure that out. So I guess I'm kind of looking for, you know, the Buddhist or therapeutic advice for getting through, you know, trauma, psychic or otherwise. There's a drama man right there. <laughs> Well, I think you're, you're talking about grief more than trauma. Um, and the notion that you're supposed to get over it, uh, I, I think gets in the way of, of uh, actually having the experience of it. Because um, it's, it's not a wrong experience. You, you, if, you, if you accept the Buddha's view of the nature of reality, being impermanence, then then we're all uh, uh, going to ex experience at least the illusion of separation from the people that we love the most. Um, and in relative reality, it's not an illusion; it's the you know the actual experience of separation. So uh, the emotional response to that is something to keep making room for rather than to feel like, oh, it's supposed to end, you know, it's supposed to go in a certain way and you're supposed to be back to who you were before. It, um, I would be careful about that because who you are now, you, you know, kind of um, uh, marinated in the experience of love, because grief is really love. Um, so, and it makes you feel the love that you might have taken for granted or just enjoyed, but now you feel it in, in a different way. Any, anyway, uh, you want to trust the, uh, uh, the process that you're going through, and you, but that's wonderful that you found a good therapist who you like, and that you're making, that, that you're making changes that need to be made, and I uh, you know you mentioned to me when just in passing that like come, you, you were coming here for the first time and maybe it'd be possible to come back and, and help out a little bit. It just like there, to allow the, the grief and the love to move you in the right direction, um, to get you know, some kind of faith that what we were talking about uh, in that process uh, uh, and to let your, let your dad still guide you, you know, from, from where he is now. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> that is nice. You know, I, wor I worked for many years with, um, with a wonderful woman. I still work with her. She, she wrote about it, so I think it's okay to say, um, who, uh, a, a, a 
a professor of economics at, uh, in London uh, who was, uh, was born in Sri Lanka, a Sri Lankan woman who would get educated at Cambridge, lived in England, married a British guy, had two kids, and she was vacationing in Sri Lanka with her husband and her kids and her parents in 2004 when the tsunami came. And everybody, they all got swept. They were in a nature preserve, uh, and the water came, and they all got swept up in it, and everybody died but her. She held onto a tree branch, you know, at, be, after being in the water. And, um, uh, and then a year later, she somehow found her way to, in, to my office, and, and I've been working with her. And she wrote a wonderful book called Wave about um, that, you know, a, it's, it's ostensibly about grief, but it's really about love. Um, so it's that people are scared to read it because they don't want to imagine the, you know, the intensity. But, but she just in one moment faced what we all uh, face in life, which is, the, you, you know, separation from the love. Um, and she survived. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, for years, uh, she couldn't even go back to her apartment in London, to her house in London, which. They had just packed up for Christmas, and you know, and every all the toy, all the clothes, and the toys, and the bed, and every you know. Um, but anyway, she wrote about it very movingly. It's, it, you might find it inspiring, and yeah, yeah, yeah. It's worth really worth looking at. That's so nice. People never die, you know. They don't. They just leave their body, and. Uh, they get tired of it. That's why they do. Because when the body is not working well, then it's tiring. And we live in a very toxic environment. The food system is very bad. The medical system is very bad. The pollution of the elements is very bad. So our bodies don't last that necessarily that well. But then anyway, they go on, you know. Cheapest method of rejuvenation and most effective is to die and be and find a nice womb and be reborn. <laughs> That's the cheapest method. So you should be happy for your dad. And I'm sure he loved you a lot. And I'm sure he only he was probably only hanging in probably from 75 to 87 for your sake. Then he decided you would make it and be a cheery person that you are. Look at you. You have a flower in your hair. You have nice tattoos on your shoulders. Your miss is cheerful. That's very nice. So relax. You say you quit your job as what? As bartending, did you say? Yeah. yeah, that's not a really good job. Yeah. <laughs> because people are, people are getting like, you know, unhealthy doing it, you know. That's, you're, that's... you're dishing it to them, so it's not actually, it's not a rewarding thing. Although you can be kind and nice to them in some way, and that can be helpful. And some of them maybe will go and find a shrink or tell them, <laughs> tell them something they don't want to hear. <laughs> but but uh, so you're going to find something better, I'm sure, a teacher or something. Anyway, anyway, I'm so happy you came here today. Oh, you're so and nice. this past weekend. It's really nice. I hope you keep doing it. Of course. I'll and, you know, it. I'm going to pursue you after you retire. Well, we still have plenty of time. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pursue you after you retire. We'll make a, make a study thing here, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Build another building or something. Mm -hmm. Make a study. Mm -hmm. Get that crazy psychodynamic guy. What's his name? Which guy? Michael, your friend. Oh, Miller? Michael? Yeah, yeah. He always wants to join. Yeah. But he's too dynamic for me. Yeah. He's scared. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not dynamic enough. <laughs> but he's great. He's a yeah, guy. he's great. He is great. Yeah. So, Michael Vincent Miller. So <laughs> that's the thing. Would you want to read this one? Yeah, you read it. Oh, you, you want read. me to read? Okay. This is written in the 18th century. Yeah, end of the 18th century. Uh, an enlightenment, enlightenment poem of a Mongolian lama, Jankya, how do you say Jankya Rolway? Jankya Rolway Dorje. Jankya and Rolway Dorje means the playful Vajra. Right. And a Vajra is a, it's a, it's a scepter, can be, but what it really means is it can mean diamond, and it can mean thunderbolt, and it basically means clear light, infinite energy, clear light. And uh, it can also mean a phallus, actually, in a very esoteric level. Mm. Isn't but, it also symbol? And rolwa means playful. Mm. Rolwe dorje, playful. Isn't vajra also anger transformed? Isn't it sometimes? Uh, no, not, not necessarily. So much. Okay. Every, you know, anger, lust, 
confusion, Everything. pride, envy, or negative things. All, all negative things are just right. misappropriations, mm -hmm. misdirections of this infinite basic energy of mm -hmm. the universe. Okay. Something like that, which is really love. It, you know, meaning that it fulfills every need. It can fulfill every need, type of thing. So this is his enlightenment song, at, at, you know, in the aftermath of his enlightenment. What's that? In the aftermath of his enlightenment, he comes. Well, I guess. I don't know. You'll see. Okay. It's, it's, it's called, complicated. It's called Song of Mother Emptiness, translated by Tenzin Bob Thurman. <laughs> <clears throat> I translated it when my mother died, actually, the first time. Hmm. And, and read it at her funeral. Really? Yeah, that was the beginning of my notorious history at funerals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> where, you know, except, and I never went really to a proper Irish wake, mm -hmm. but I like cultures where they're celebratory at funerals. Mm -hmm. They should be, instead of all mopey mm -hmm. and weird, you know, like, uh, <laughs> you know? Everyone feels they're supposed to do that, so mm -hmm. they do, you know. How did it go over? There's even a thing, you know that thing in the Book of the Dead, there's a thing in the Book of the Dead that warns you. It's, a, you know, you read it to the person who passed and you warn them, you say, look, when you, after you die, and you're still hang around, and then you recover your natural human ability to read everybody else's mind, because you become like a field rather than a boundary thing, and you don't, you're not shut down by blocks. And so when you go to your own funeral, and of course you'll notice your own body, you know, and you go and even wonder who it is, or maybe you, if you don't get into where you try to get back into it, that won't work. And, uh, but the one thing is, don't be pissed off when you read the mind of some relative who's going, oh, Bob, I'm so sad. Oh, what are we going to do with Al? He's such a great guy. And then you're reading the underneath mind saying, good riddance, that bum. Like, I'm so sick of him, like, making jokes at me and blah, blah, blah. And just don't be mad. Everybody has multiple levels of thought in their mind. And you normally don't notice them, but now you will. So don't be mad. And when the priest who's conducting the funeral is only thinking about the beer and the burger they're going to have when the <laughs> damn thing is over. And they're going blah, 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 but they don't care at all about it. And don't be mad at the priest. That's just the way people are. Did you read Lincoln and the Bardo yet? No. Oh, it's so is that, good. I got to read that. Who oh, wrote that? George Saunders. George who? Saunders. You, Saunders. Okay. You know George Saunders? S-A-U? Yeah. OK, Lincoln Buddha, and the Bardo. He's a Buddhist novelist. I saw the movie Lincoln the Vampire. No, Lincoln and the Bardo. <laughs> no, it's so good, Lincoln and the Bardo. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, sorry. Song of Mother Emptiness by John Kiel Rollway Dorje, translated by Tenzin Bob Thurman, read for the first time at his mother's funeral. Oh, thatness of profound relativity, oh wonder, may the guru who nakedly reveals this as it is his kindness irrepayable be enthroned in my heart. I will speak spontaneously whatever comes to mind. This is two centuries before Freud. I will speak spontaneously whatever comes to mind. I was like a mad child, long lost his old mother, never could find her though she was with him always. But now it seems I'm about to find that kind old Amma. Amma is like a nurse or mother. Now it seems I'm about to find that kind old Amma, since big brother relativity hints where she hides. I think, yes, yes, then no, no, then could it be really? These various subjects and objects are mother's smiling face. These births, deaths, and changes are mother's lying words. The undeceiving mother has deceived me. My only hope of refuge is in brother relativity. But the sole chance for freedom is just old mother's love. If this subject-object situation were all there was, the three-time Buddhas could find no way to save us. But liberation is possible, since these various changes are but the changes of the unchanging mother. The mutual interdependence of ineffable mother where nothing has status and relativity where everything appears is exactly what must be understood. Seeking my old father and just not finding is the actual finding of my old mother. Then from my mother's lap I find my old father. 
I, child of such kind parents, cry out for their refuge. When mother's neither one nor many face seems to be there ineffably reflected in the clear mirror of big brother relativity, how crazy I was not to start this quest. The generous testaments of Nagarjuna and Chandrakirti were but papers blown away by the wind until Songkhapa, Manjusari's essence, sent his retriever hawk to get them. Then was I saved the trials of far questing and allowed to see my old mother, natural, here with me. Nowadays, some of the bright ones of our school, fond of terms such as self-sufficiency and truth status, seem to put aside what obviously appears before them and seek some fabulous unicorn to be critiqued. They never acknowledge this obvious appearance. They explain and explain not hitting the crux and that old mother completely escapes them. Though things surely do exist somehow, their reality seems not to be this horny incompatibility, since the intimacy of father-mother union seems inseparably tender and cozy. So you want me to go on? No, no. That's I think skip that. It's okay. too complicated because yeah. it, it, no one will appreciate it. He's critiquing. But there's this other one here. Yeah, it goes at the end. It's nice. Uh, at, the, at the end. I think that this is just from here, though, mm -hmm. from though. <clears throat> though by no means am I an heir to omniscience, through skill with the reins of analysis and devotion, I rode well the fine stallion of the ancestral texts and won our freedom from the dangerous abyss. No need to seek her, she's the seeker himself. Don't cling to her truth, she is utter falsehood. <laughs> Don't negate her falseness, it is truth itself. It's sufficient to rest in the unabsolute, unceased. Though I don't see my mother, by her mere name it seems I encounter the long-lost kind parents, as if in face-to-face -face confrontation. Great thanks, O Nagarjuna and sons. Great thanks, O Sankhapa Lama. Great thanks, O kind Guru Lama. As the way to repay all your kindness, I thus honor our mother, emptiness. My unproduced, inexpressible old mother cradles gently the tiny infant of intellect. With the banquet of her perfectly good expressions, may she lead all beings to true happiness. Imala Rolway Dorje, that's like a praise, I think. Aola, my dance of joy. Ahola, honor the three gems. Thank you. I like that one. You like that yourself. I love that myself. It's because it's personal, you know. It's both personal he and... He was, uh, you know, these lamas have a difficult life because in a way they're taken from their parents at a young yeah. age. But they kind of don't mind, actually. And the parents also don't mind. They feel honored. And they are exceptional as children, actually, or always, usually. There's all kind of weird phenomena happen when they're born. And um, he, beca he became the teacher of the longest serving Manchu emperor mm. in the 18th century. And mm. did tremendous great works in China and Tibet and Mongolia, keeping peace and things. And working with the 7th and 8th Dalai Lama. He was their close colleague, but he was their person in Beijing, mm. that type of thing. And making sure that some court intrigues and things didn't come down on a bad way on the Tibetans. Mm. All through the 18th century. It's a remarkable person, really. I love it. Can you explain? My old Mongolian uh, teacher insisted I had to really read this. Yeah, I love this thing. Can you explain? Explain about the mother emptiness. What? Explain about the mother emptiness. Well, it's thing. all these wonderful things, you know. The thatness. Oh, thatness of profound relativity. You know, thatness means. That kind of thing, you know, when you're in a certain state and you see things and each one of them is like a jewel or it's like infinity or something like that, you know, that expression. And that's the thatness of the thing. It's like, I think Meister Eckhart, the great mystic, Western mystic, he called it istigkeit, isness of mm. things. You know? And then there's, but there's two kinds. There's suchness and thatness, which are not the same. Many people translate them as the same thing, but they're not. Thatness is when you have a sense of the nirvana in the specific phenomenon you know, that you see, that it is nirvana as itself. So you have non-duality, 
in the relative thing. And suchness is where the relative thing, in non-duality, is the relative thing sort of pointing to the absolute, mm. light, you know, clear light of the void. Mm. So, it, it's, which means it's like, such means like that, such as that, you know. It's not the same. It, it's a subtle difference, you know. So, he says, so oh, that, that's the profound relativity. And, oh, wonder. And then he's like, he's going to be spontaneous. That's like the guy, I like, you know, that, that Pablo Neruda, you know, the poetry that came to him had no face. Right. Meaning it was just true, you know, what is a face? It's a mask. It's where we divide ourselves from the subjectivity of ourselves with the objects around us and our environment. And it's sort of the place of the separation, actually, is the face, you know. Mm. And so that he had no face has meant that the poetry was completely merged with him, mm -hmm. you know, and with the world, you know. Mm. And it's just, it's a complete flow being, you yeah. could say, something like that. And then this one, he looks, he looks at himself, and he realizes he was a mad child who thought he'd lost his old mother. And he couldn't find her, but she was always there. And now I think I'm just about to find her. You know, he's kind of having a threshold experience. Since the big brother relativity hints where she hides. But hints, just a hint. And that she's hiding someplace. So then he says, oh, yeah, yeah, right. Then, oh, no, oh, no. And then, could it really be? <laughs> That's more like it. It's like enlightenment. It's like where it has you, and you don't have it, necessarily. Mm -hmm. But it has you. And then all these, these things. But the undeceiving mother has deceived my own hope of refuge is in brother relativity. Because brother, relativity is what is emptiness in play, you know, actually. And it depicts a sibling. And of course, big brother in those cultures is very much stand in for the father, you know, if you mm -hmm. want to do a psychoanalytic mm -hmm. kind of thing. And then the sole chance for freedom is just old mother's love. The love is that infinite energy which is called the vajra or clear light of the void. If this subject object situation was all there was, the three time Buddhas could find a way to save us. So that's the thing. I don't want to reread it again. You just read it. I, I liked hearing you read it because I don't know why. It's, <laughs> it's not that good until you write it out in your own handwriting. <laughs> I've written that out. But it's out good. Many times. No, it's good. It's good. <laughs> Seeking my old father and just not finding is the actual finding of my old mother. Then from my mother's, it's like seeking the self, the absolute thing. And then just not finding it is the finding. But it doesn't mean that you find the not finding. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a very, it's all the, you know, I was thinking, they have this meditation studies. I can't remember where I read it, you know, like guys with EEGs and stuff, you know, like fMRIs. And they have two subjects in this one study. And one is a Hindu Swami type but an adept one, and one is a Zen guy, also adept. And then they make a loud noise, and they're in meditative state, they're sort of on where they mm -hmm. choose to be. And then their EEGs and everything is on them. You know. And the uh, Hindu guy doesn't register the loud noise at all. Mm -hmm. There's not a tiniest blip in the, whatever it is, the signals. Mm -hmm. And the Zen guy totally registers it mm -hmm. and returns exactly to the same place they were. Mm -hmm. So there's a blip and it's just back, right back mm -hmm. on the same plane instantly. Mm -hmm. So it integrates in those, the blip, mm -hmm. but doesn't ignore it. Mm -hmm. So that's the danger of meditation. Mm -hmm. the, why, why I said that shamatha is considered in this, this tradition to be dangerous in the sense that the basic sickness that we have is a sense that, there, that our essential being is something isolated from everything else. It's an absolute us identity that's there, and its, and its basic status is disconnected. And then, but yet we feel we're very sensitive and all this, so we, we tend to want to withdraw into it. So that's, our, so that's the basic psychosis that Buddha diagnosed. Mm -hmm. That's the second noble truth. Mm -hmm. You know, is that we, we have this false sense of self, that it's something separate. So therefore, our relationality is highly problematic for us. And so there's a tendency to seek an absolute that's disconnected. And you have all those theories of God, 
or some absolute power that's, dis that's not connected. It somehow it's in charge, controls everything, which is a fantasy, but it's not connected to it, so it doesn't affect it, right? Mm -hmm. That's a psychotic condition. And so when you develop one-pointedness without realizing the irrationality and the unviability of that, then you will aim toward that state of separation. And Theravada Buddha, in mm -hmm. the, any kind of form of Buddha, dualistic Buddhism even, although he let those people think that they were going to get out of the universe and they, to safety, because you know, there was no safety in it, he, he said, oh, but by the way, when you, as you become a meditative adept, beyond the speed of light, beyond mass, in other words, which is the realm of pure equanimity, love, joy, or love, compassion, joy, equanimity, you know, the Brahma realms. Mm -hmm. Beyond that are the four formless or immaterial realms, you know, pure mind realms. And it's infinite space, that disappeared state. Infinite consciousness, where consciousness seeks to encompass it and therefore becomes infinite, in a sense, has a sense of subjectively getting lost. And then absolute nothingness, like a deep sleep state, and then beyond consciousness and unconscious, the most subtle state, mm. where you're sort of conscious and unconscious, but totally isolated from any differentiation, actually. And, and then Buddha says, none of those are nirvana. None of them are nirvana. And then even in the Pali version of the Mahaparinirvana Sutta, mm -hmm. when Buddha pass, leaves his body, mm -hmm. he it says that his mind goes into the four immeasurables, mm -hmm. those four bliss-type Brahma states of the realm of pure matter or mm -hmm. pure form. Then they go into the four formless states, infinite space, consciousness, nothingness, or feeling, a simulation of nothingness, because obviously it's not nothing, it's a state, mental state, and then beyond nothing and something, or beyond consciousness, unconscious, whatever you want to call it, the, the, which Hindus think is the ultimate mm -hmm. achievement, nirvikalpa samadhi, they call it. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, Ananda, his close attendant and, and cousin and, you know, whatever, but not yet an arhat, mm -hmm. he says to Kashyapa, the arhat who is present at Buddha's passing, he says, oh, now he's gone from the body. And, and they says, no, 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 not, not yet. Which and Ananda's puzzled because he senses that he disappeared in a way. He senses that. But the disappearance is still contained mm. within the central nervous system or something. And then it says the Buddha's consciousness goes back down through those four states, down through the four immeasurables to this boundary between the realm of desire, or the lust realm, and then the realm of pure, pure matter. And then again up through the love, immeasurable love, joy, love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. And then at that point, which is the event horizon of the formless, between form and formless, then he leaves the body. Mm. And that later in Mahayana Sutras is where all the Buddha lands are, actually. Mm. In that event horizon is all kinds of infinities in their cosmology. Mm. So he, in other words, he doesn't leave the realm of matter. Mm -hmm. He goes to this most subtle realm of matter at the horizon of the immaterial, mm. something right at the speed of light, mm. where there's all kind of infinite worlds at that thing. Like that. It's really... Cool. So, but the danger is, if you, and the only danger is, it's not really, it is a danger in the sense that you want to become an infinite analyst. You want to be able to help all beings, right? You want to become a Buddha. So if you do your one pointedness without fully understanding the royal reason of relativity, mm -hmm. that anything you experience, even if it seems to be an absolute, because you experience its relative. So your automatic balm of relativizing whatever happens, whatever you imagine or perceive, it gets relativized. God is relativized. Goddess is relativized. Everything is relativized. If, if you lack that, the, the seduction of those formless states is so huge that you will become a, what they call a deity of the formless realm. Mm -hmm. And then the frustrating part about formless realms is Total sleep, total unconsciousness, like deeper than unconscious, like joyous, conscious unconsciousness, <laughs> is that there's no sense of time. So therefore, there's only experience of the threshold in and out. Mm -hmm. But you could stay there for several big bangs, a big crunch, 
and you'll be back on 42nd Street mm -hmm. and know nobody in a different planet, in a different universe. And you know nobody, and mom and dad and your pals are all gone. And, you don't, and, you're, not, and you're nowhere. So it's a huge waste of time, mm -hmm. basically, mm -hmm. in your psychotic, mm -hmm. it's all one and it's only me. Mm -hmm. You know? So that's the danger. You know? mm -hmm. So I don't, why did I launch into that? So uh, the mother, the, the point about it is, is that this is nirvana now. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we have to develop art and skill, the art of analysis, the art of meditating, the art of beauty and joy, you know, the art of helping others get out of their traps, you know, which is what it is, That's, which is like a play, you know, right? And uh, and then and then uh, well, it's not quite time yet. But it's, uh, then there's this issue of uh, of uh, Menla and being here. Everybody, is everybody anybody unhappy? <laughs> what? Somebody must be miserable. <laughs> Other than me, I promise I am. <laughs> Justin. Are you unhappy? Generally, no, but I can be. You can be? Yes. Well, what's your question then? My question would be this. Just up the mic. Um. <laughs> um, recently, we've seen a lot of people absolutizing um, their critics or people who bring up conflict as crazy. Um, you hear as that? What? As, as crazy or crazy or insane. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I'd like to hear what you guys have to say about crazy within the Buddhist tradition and the psychoanalyst yes. tradition. Because I know within the Tibetan tradition, there's a whole crazy wisdom tradition that people often misquote and yes. talk about. So I'd like to hear some perspective on cra craziness and crazy well, wisdom. Well, it is true that uh, the great Milarepa, the St. Francis of Tibetan Buddhism, he said that, and a lot of people have said in other parts of the tradition, but that the mundane person seems crazy from the spiritual person in the sense of the one, the bodhisattva who seeks Buddhahood, in the sense that the mundane person seeks wealth, security, power, dominance, status, fame, all these things, which do them no good, actually. The minute they die, they're all wiped out. And they are cruising toward death. And, they, and then they reborn without all those things they spent their whole human life working for. So they're wasting their time, in a sense. They're wasting the precious moment of the human life where they can consciously evolve to become a being of pure flow, a, an infinite flow being, which means the name of Buddha. You know, it's another Buddha name. And, um, and so, so the, the yogi or yogini is someone who realizes that's what, the mean, that's what human life is for. It's not that anybody has given human life that meaning. That's not the case. It's not this kind of providence, somebody who's in control of it all, inscrutably putting people to do things, which people from theistic societies always tend to think somebody's behind it all, you know, type of thing. It's not that. To live in a, in a, meaninglessly is meaningless, just like the materialists say, in a way. And they have it swallowed up by nothingness at death, so it's kind of been meaningless. And they think that's brave to be meaningless. And actually, to just live for the immediate whatever gratification is meaningless because it goes away. It's not really, ha it's not real happiness, it's not real bliss, it's just temporary. But you can choose to give it a meaning if you become inspired that you can genuinely live by love, that you can be genuinely blissful, that other beings, you can help them find their own inner bliss, that the most powerful energy in the universe is bliss, more powerful than a nuclear the nuclear explosion is hatred. But that's actually weaker, ultimately, than bliss. That's why the fierce deities, it's a weird thing. The, they stand on a disk called a solar disk, solar fusion disk. And it is said that it is, that disk, it's like in those Superman movies, you know, the bad guys, they put them in a little flat thing, you know, and mm -hmm. then they escape from it. Some of the later Superman movies, the Krypton, Krypton evil, evil beings. So they have like a fusion reaction in this disk. 
and they're standing on it. And it's, they can control it with love. You know, mm. They can keep things plasmatic and soft and happy to go stay. Because the strong force in the atom is stronger than the, 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 the chain reaction mm. level. It blocks the chain reaction, mm. supposedly. Mm. And, um, which is nice to think. <laughs> mm. well, naturally, being in a consensual materialist reality, one finds that almost impossible to think. So, so th therefore, but they, they just, that's their only priority. So Milarepa lived in a cave after he murdered 35 people by sorcery before that. Then he got this different inspiration and he, because he had gone so negative, he had to do positive really heavily and he lived in this cave which he was able to do because of the inner energy that he created, that inner heat. And in the winter he stayed in these unbelievably cold places in the high Himalayas. But he, and he, that's crazy. People thought he was crazy. So he said, that's natural. The mundane person, you're not in security, you're not seeking a house, you're not seeking a family, you're not this and that status. You're just there singing songs in the mountains. So you're crazy. So there is this thing about what's crazy and what's not crazy. This video was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. membership community and viewers like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, including special invites to trips around the world with Robert Thurman and geographic expeditions, please visit TibetHouse.us.